Business Matters is brought to you in part by Lionberger Construction. Hello and welcome to Business Matters, a program that strives to explore that subject from a variety of viewpoints and scenarios, featuring interviews with the people helping to grow jobs, the economy, and the Blue Ridge region, because business matters. I'm Gene Morano. We have a very special show today as we go one-on-one -on -one with Nancy Howell Agee, the President and Chief Executive Officer for Carilion Clinic, which has undergone dramatic changes in its scope over the past two decades, also adapting to challenges posed by the pandemic early on and taking the lead in putting vaccine shots in arms locally. Nancy Agee, welcome to the show. I really appreciate it. I know how busy you are. Thanks, Gene. It's certainly been a busy time. And now I can tell people I've been in your office because I can see your office, if that is your <laughs> office. Um, My office. But think, you know, Nancy, think back over a year ago um, when you first heard about the coronavirus. Did you have any idea how it was going to uh, turn the world upside down and, and put such a strain on healthcare systems? Thankfully, no. I um, about five years ago, I guess, I was listening to a talk by the head of the CDC, and he said a pandemic's coming. It's just a matter of time, and. I remember that conversation. We was in a meeting in Chicago thinking, what does that mean exactly? You know, what's a pandemic? And um, so fast forward to what, 14 months ago, and when we started, started hearing about things that were happening in New York and uh, the Northwest, particularly in the Washington state area, um, you know, we were three months, maybe two and a half months later, getting anything, having anything here. and. I don't know, maybe at the time we even thought it will pass us by. It's not going to happen here in this part of Virginia. Um, so, of course, once we started having cases and I, I can remember how frightening that was and beginning to look out and, and thinking, you know, what does this really mean, not just to individuals who, of course, were so sick or are dying, uh, but what does this mean to our health system? to the industry and to the world. So it, lots of thoughts going through your head mm -hmm. for the, in those early days. And you uh, assembled, uh, the Korean assembled an action team, an incident command. Uh, how did that, talk about the scope of that. So we, we have a disaster plan uh, that we practice periodically, usually thinking of things like floods or, you know, um, weather-related events um, or major accidents, multi-vehicle multi accidents, that sort of thing. So we plan for that. We practice, you know, every year. Um, and because, the, because this pandemic started elsewhere, we were able to stand up our uh, incident command center early on. So we, even though we didn't have any cases here, we set that up and it was very comprehensive. Um, with, uh, with everything from our disaster planning team, who's on site all the time, uh, to nursing, to chaplains, to materials management, all of those folks assembled. We had a, a we have space for um, the incident command center, and we do that across our whole system. So it isn't just for our Roanoke entities. Mm -hmm. You know, you brought that up. Uh, when people think of Carilion Clinic, a lot of times, Nancy, they think of Carilion Roanoke Memorial Hospital, but Carilion Clinic has seven hospitals, ranging from the third largest in Virginia to mid-sized community and small or rural critical access hospitals in southwest Virginia, as well as physician outpatient offices. Do you think some of that sort of gets lost, that people maybe don't have, how big of an idea how big the Carilion system is? Yeah, it's um, it's always interesting to me. You know, we're the largest employer west of Richmond, Virginia. Uh, we have we do have a very large physician employed physician group, with about 200 separate practices, going up into uh, heading up into northern Virginia, um, then all the way to far southwest Virginia, and um, and then of course seven hospitals, a children's hospital, so many. Um, different services that we provide for this region. For instance, we have more than 44 employed orthopedists 
We have nine neurosurgeons. You know, we have a lot of specialization and take care of anything imaginable. We don't do transplants at this time. Mm -hmm. um, but aside from that, just really care, provide all the services anyone could ever need. I promise we won't talk about the pandemic for the whole 26 minutes, Nancy, but a couple more questions. What was the challenge, especially maybe in some of your smaller hospitals, in making sure that the, uh, that the system had access to the staff and the equipment and the PPE, personal protective equipment they needed, during the teeth of the pandemic? What was the big challenge there? I, I would say there were probably three challenges. One, it was PPE. It wasn't just in our smaller hospitals, it was every place. And because the rules kept changing from the CDC, the FDA, from the from the White House, um, we were we found ourselves in you know constantly responding. As a matter of fact, we got ahead of some of that quite early and decided we were going to have everyone be masked well before it was required. And um, but getting PPE was a full time job for so many and really difficult. Our materials management people walk on water you know i'm so impressed with what they did and the hours they spent and still do um, unfortunately not only was there a scarcity but but the cost was unbelievable a little paper mask that we all wear um just cost maybe 50 cents you know it's very inexpensive um, at the height of the pandemic they were each individual mask was five dollars Wow. I mean, the price gouging was unbelievable. So not only did we, were we worried we didn't have what we needed, um, of course, you needed N95s or N100s. They had to be fit tested. They're very tight fit on the face uh, for anybody in the clinical area. So that was the one was PPE. The second was having staff trained to care for resp you know, severe respiratory illness. And while we have in Roanoke, um, ICUs and, and you know very um, extensive services that would be less so in our community hospitals um, and so we had to train staff quickly we also needed negative pressure rooms negative pressure rooms is an air exchange so we're, and a person with infectious disease needs to be in a negative pressure room and we don't have call for that very often uh, with an infectious respiratory disease. Mm. And so we had to very quickly figure out a way to create negative pressure regions in the emergency, in all of our emergency departments and negative pressure rooms in all of our hospitals. I know, I, Great, I, I, lots of innovation, lots of uh, new ways of doing mm. things. I know I was watching your Reuters video, the video you did for Reuters where you talked, Nancy, about nearly half the patients uh, it, in the system are over 65 and nearly half have a chronic condition. So it sounds like really uh, there were a lot of people that were really ripe to get COVID-19. Yeah, the, the, um, the people who actually experienced the most mortality and, and regrettably morbidity um, were people who had chronic illnesses or people who were more vulnerable were, were people that were 65 and older. Mm -hmm. Um, I wanted to ask you before we move on, um, at one point last year you had to pause voluntary surgeries and, and ER visits went down and, and it led to some temporary pay cuts for Carillion from you on down. Um, just talk about how difficult that decision w w was to make and I guess it lasted what, about two months? Yeah, the, um, again, before the governor even required everyone to shut down, we decided that we needed to be sure there was plenty of room in our hospitals uh, for patients with COVID. And that meant changing up what we were doing and so-called elective surgeries. You know, people sometimes think elective surgery means, uh, could even mean unnecessary. And that's, nothing could be further from the truth. These are just not something that you need to do emergently, um, but we, we slowed down or canceled, uh, postponed all of our procedures, surgeries, um, imaging procedures, MRI, CT, all of those sorts of things that we could um, so that we could be sure that we had all the resources we needed for patients with COVID. Mm -hmm. That was, um, you know, the health system, the way the health system's paid, um, 
and we can talk about that some other time. Nobody would have ever designed a health system that gets paid the way it does. Right, the way right. largely we get paid are for the higher end um, services like procedures, like surgeries, like high end imaging. And um, to disrupt all of that was a significant hit to our bottom line. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, and so we had to make, so I had to make some difficult decisions about pay, um, using resources, change, you know, changing a lot of policies so that we could get through that. I'm wondering, you know, Nancy. Well, also, I, I just want to sure. say it was a difficult decision, but boy, it was not only was it the right decision, it was it was embraced by this these fabulous people who work here. And there was just not a single pushback. It was, of course, we will do whatever we can and tighten our belts. Um, I did not get a single pushback from people about the change in their salary, about the work that we had to do. And, you know, some of, um, some of the people here that have worked hours and hours and hours, like our chief operating officer, Steve Arner, and chief medical officer, and just so many people who've been, who continue to work hard, often making decisions without the information that you needed. Mm-hmm. So we're used to making decisions, but you're usually pretty well informed. Um, and in this case, you had to make decisions without, with insufficient information. Mm-hmm. And I know it couldn't have been easy. Um, you started as a nurse, you worked your way up, you went to business school at Northwestern, you were the COO uh, when you and Ed Murphy sort of led the transition to a physician uh, clinic led model, uh, kind of like a Mayo Clinic model or something. Um, I'm just wondering, when you, what you went through over the past year, what part of your career path really helped you the most? Or was it even maybe the, the, the fact that people knew you for so long, Nancy, that they trusted in, in what you were doing and they, they supported where Carillion had to go? Well, I'd like to think that we've built uh, trust and um, integrity, and uh, and I think that's true. Um, as far as my personal leadership style, it's um, it's very much leans on relationships, on um, communication, frequent communication, and also and I'm gifted with this. It was my father's gift to me. He was a very patient man. I'm a very patient <laughs> person. It takes a lot to get me riled <laughs> up, <laughs> and. Uh, you know, that doesn't say that I don't have joy and passion, but um, very pa- patient, calm. Um, as they say, take your own pulse first, you know, put the oxygen mask on yourself first, be calm, and then, then you can lead through right. with others. And I think you told me before that the, the biggest thing, you, one of the things you got out of the Northwestern Experience Business School was, was collaboration, communication, that type of thing. I would say that, yes, I would say the one thing I got out of Northwestern that has a, has been, a, again, a gift, and that was negotiating with heart. I took a course on, a graduate course on negotiation. I'm still, I still refer to the book often. Um, the idea there is that you don't have winners and losers. So with a negotiation, um, with collaboration, more can get done and no one goes away feeling um, hurt mm-hmm. because that can come back to you later, right? In a, in a bad way. So I, that negotiating with heart um, is a, is, was a really important construct for me to learn. Mm-hmm. Speaking of something that's not going away, it, it looks, Nancy, coming out of the pandemic as we get up, that telemedicine, which exploded for Carillion, over the past year, televisits, telehealth. Uh, and uh, I, I talked to somebody at Carillion and it went up exponentially last year. And a lot of that will remain in place. Do you see a permanent place for more telehealth visits? Certainly, certainly think that digital transformation is going to happen, is happening in healthcare. And um, as a matter of fact, we did develop a strategic plan in the midst of COVID for the next five years. And a big part of that is our digital transformation. Mm-hmm. A component of that are telehealth visits or telephonic visits. Uh, we found that even telephonic visits can be helpful. And um, at, the, at the height of the pandemic, nearly 78% of all of our uh, visits, ambulatory visits were done in a, 
either by telephone or televisit, uh, televideo. And it's now about 30% and, and probably changing every day. So, you know, there's some pent up demand. People need to be seen by a provider, uh, but we're still doing quite a lot and we'll be doing, continue that process. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering what, what other types of uh, innovation maybe was spurred by the pandemic in the Carillion orbit? What types of innovation? I know that uh, uh, Carillion innovation, for instance, is not that old. Talk about innovation within the Carillion system where you encourage doctors, nurses, staff, even to come forward with, uh, with good ideas. Yeah, well, you, you've sort of said it all. You know, it started really with the um, Virginia Tech Carillion Partnership, developing the medical school, developing the research institute and beginning to focus on research and innovation. More recently, in the last several years, we um, created an innovation fund, uh, partly a fund that we, uh, Carillion's doing, partly the fund that we're doing with Virginia Tech to, to provide some seed money for innovation. We have a, a team of people now helping, you know, with tons of good ideas, um, our, our our clinicians have great ideas, our physicians and uh, our nurses. And so we're trying to find ways for them to take those good ideas, innovate around them and see if they can be used in the industry or commercialized. Hmm. And uh, so that's real new for us. And it, it's incredibly exciting. One of the things that we have is a simulation center where staff can go not only to learn about care, but also to sort of practice um, on a, in a simulated environment to see if their innovations work and to get ideas from others about how it could be better, what we could do, with, what could be done with that innovation. Yeah, I've actually been to the simulation center, which is near Dr. Pepper Park at the bridges. So, uh, and it looks like they've got a lot of interesting things in there. Um, I uh, describe the relationship now, Nancy, between Carillion Clinic, the Virginia Tech Carillion. School of Medicine, and even the Freyland Biomedical Research Institute right next door on the campus. What type of synergy is there? Is there resource uh, sharing, joint projects, opportunities for learning? Is, it, is there some kind of a synergy there? Oh yeah, it, it's uh, almost invisible where one starts and one ends, right? So the, the medical school, the research institute, Carillion clinical activities um, are all integrated. And uh, for instance, the, the faculty for the medical school are physicians employed by us. The students' clinical facilities are all our facilities. Um, you know, I'm back and forth myself across the street. The Research Institute, um, there, there are researchers that are full-time in the Research Institute. We also have physicians uh, practicing clinically but doing research in the research institute. And I, we see a lot more opportunity going forward in the, it, not just here on the campus with the medical school and the Franklin Biomedical Research at uh, the Institute at VTC, um, but also closer relationships with the engineering school, um, with other programs. For instance, we've created a nutrition program with Virginia Tech and also with Radford University. So we have Radford University Carillion. We have a very large nursing school. We have a lot of other health careers happening right here on the campus. And part of that is working together cooperatively, interprofessionally, and innovation kind of is the key word going forward. So when something like a pandemic happens, and I know the, uh, the uh, Research Institute was getting involved with COVID testing for health district statewide. So when something like a pandemic happens, Nancy, does it sort of spur innovation and, and motivate people to, to I help? Think so. I, I think um, it, it's, it's, it's funny, but sort of opening up our notion to innovation, which preceded the pandemic, started bringing people forward with good ideas. Uh, but having said that, the pandemic was certainly a catalyst for practical things we could do that were needed right then. Um, just for instance, the N95s we talked about earlier, which were in short supply and difficult to get, the um, cleaning them. So we created a process to clean them and to be able to use them safely by staff after multiple uses. Mm -hmm. We also did part of that with Virginia Tech. So 
so we had that nice integration together as we looked at practical needs for our staff. Let's look forward a little bit. Uh, you, despite everything going on, there, there are uh, expansion plans in the work. Uh, I guess the first visible evidence of that expansion will be Carillion Children's, the outpatient center at the Tanglewood Mall. Nancy, talk yep. about that. Uh, that's going to be launching sometime late this summer or whatever. How excited are you about that, to have all those services in one area? And that's really going to be an economic driver for Southwest County. I think that's right. And we can't ever forget that we are an economic engine as the largest employer west of Richmond, Virginia. And we know what happened with our orthopedic and neurosciences um, center over at what was once U Crops grocery store. Um, once we decided to take that abandoned building and build inside of it and have this throbbing orthopedic and neurosciences services there, let's see, a, a grocery store opened on site three restaurants and I laugh and say the issue now is parking right? Mm -hmm, <laughs> um, right I think we'll see something similar at Tanglewood where currently we have a lot of children's services uh, specialists and subspecialists as a matter of fact we have as many or more than any other place in the state except for the children's hospital in Norfolk and that gets lost a little bit and we have you know kids who have and parents who have to go from place to place to place because we're dispersed. Um, so I'm very excited and really pleased about having things all in one location. I think that will be enormously helpful for these families um, who sometimes drive two and three hours to get here for a variety of services. And it's I was able to go through the, the uh, new facility a week or so ago. And I'll tell you, it's 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 wonderful. It's, it's gonna be, beautiful, friendly, and uh, everything will be together, and I think it'll be a really nice space for everyone. That's the old J.C. Penney store, and it's already spurred growth. There's already going to be outbuildings out front where people can go eat, and from what I've read, uh, 1,000 to 1,500 vi visits a day, people in and out of the Carillion Children's Center, so there's built-in yep. activity right there. Yeah, and the um, the owners have already told us that they're you know getting a number of people wanting to move into the mall itself or moving into the outbuildings. So it's already it's stimulating growth in that area. How how are things going, Nancy? Where they push back at all the the Crystal uh, Spring Tower expansion on the main campus, and I think you're going to build a, another behavioral health building across the street, and and also the Carillion clinic cancer center which is on reserve are they still on track with were, were they delayed a little bit by the pandemic the pandemic we did delay um, a bit I think everything will end up being on time but we did have to um, postpone some some of the activities some of what you saw on you may see if you drive down Jefferson Street early on was the water authority uh, staging and making some changes but we are now you know, full speed ahead. So at Running Memorial, we are expanding the emergency department. We are adding a cardiovascular um, center and uh, we're gonna build this, this whole facility, this new building next door to the mountain pavilion, um, South Pavilion, so in that area on Jefferson Street. Uh, we're going to build it so that we can also build onto it if we needed to. And I'm, I'm incredibly excited and there'll be parking underneath uh, like we do for most of the things around here because <laughs> of because uh, we're right next to this big round run of river. Right. Across the street and connected by a uh, sky bridge um, will be a, park, a new parking garage and also a behavioral health um, hospital. Mm -hmm. So all of that is on, uh, ongoing and, and um, you mentioned the cancer center and I should probably step back and say um, we're, we're raising money for the cancer center and you might say well you're building this why don't you just build all of that. And there are so many capital needs and capital is expensive um, and so we had to set some priorities but we think that the cancer center likewise has needs. So our hope is to break down on that in about two years and, um, and build a really amazing, friendly, um, comfortable, high-tech, state-of-the-science building uh, right here on the campus. 
We're also, I know you've told me that the, the Cancer Center can take advantage of uh, faculty and students at the medical school and the, and the Franklin Biomedical Research Institute. So can all, again, that synergy. That's right, yeah, we are, um, you know, we do, we have a, so many resources already devoted to cancer care, um, but we know that we can do more, that we can do more clinical trials, that we can actually do research with the research institute and the medical school. And so all, you know, I think our future is very bright for all clinical care. And uh, my personal passion, of course, is in cancer. That's where my clinical work was done. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the work that we do, the things that we provide for this region, and, you know, I'll go back to the pandemic for a, a minute and just say that um, the vaccinations. So we have, we have done um, the more than 125,000 shots in the arm that our staff have done. And I think that shows you the the real value of having a health system headquartered here, not for profit, which seeks out to, to help this community and fulfill our mission by improving their health. And getting them back to work too, and out in public. Definitely, yeah, let's all get back. I'm happy we're doing it this way, but um, I'd be glad when we can meet in person again. All right, we're going to have to leave it there. Nancy Howell, AG, the President and Chief Executive Officer for Korean Clinic. Nancy, it's been an honor. Thank you for making the time, and thank you, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. My pleasure. If you have any questions or show suggestions, email us at businessmatters at blueridgepbs.org. And if you missed any of our previous episodes, you can watch them on our website at blueridgepbs.org.